Recently, I've been playing around with some high power LEDs. To efficiently dim their brightness, I built up this simple test circuit, which features a function generator to create an adjustable PWM signal, an N channel MOSFET in series to the LED to actually turn it on and off rapidly, and a TC4420 MOSFET driver IC to charge slash discharge the power MOSFET's gate as quickly as possible. Now in the low frequency range, this circuit dims the LED perfectly fine by changing the duty cycle of the PWM signal. But while for example using a frequency of 100 kHz and a duty cycle of 1%, the circuit works for a couple of minutes but then randomly stops working, because the MOSFET driver IC apparently destroyed itself. After replacing it, the circuit worked fine once again. But this time I examined the pins voltages of the IC with my oscilloscope, to determine the culprits. And while probing the supply voltage pin of the IC, I noticed that there occurred 100 kHz oscillations with peak voltages of 28 and 2 volts. Since that is partly beyond the IC's maximum supply voltage, it is no wonder that it self-destructs after a while. To solve this problem, the Wirt Electronic ISOS group recently sent me three of their capacitor design kits. The General Purpose DC Film Capacitors design kit, the Multilayer Ceramic Chip Capacitors design kit, and the Aluminum Electrolytic Capacitors design kit. So in this video, let's solve this mysterious IC supply voltage problem and learn the difference between those three capacitor types to find out which one you should use for which circuits. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by the Wirt Electronic ISOS Group. Let's start off with our MOSFET driver IC problem. The supply voltage breaks down and afterwards an oscillation occurs. This happens with a frequency of 100 kHz, which not coincidentally is the exact moment the power MOSFET's gate gets charged up. So if we break it down, the input signal gets pulled high, which ultimately connects the gate of our power MOSFET to the supply voltage. This action requires current for our IC in order to power its own components and ultimately charge up its own MOSFET gates as quickly as possible. While observing this IC current through a 1 ohm shunt, I noticed that it reached its first peak value of around 2 amps within only 50 nanoseconds. The only problem is that my power supply, due to its internal construction, is not the fastest acting energy source. That is why we can model its output impedance as a small resistor in series with an inductor. Now if the IC would require a constant 1 amp, we would only get a small voltage drop across the resistor, but no other problems, since an inductor voltage drop only exists with a changing current flow. But since our IC wants to have 2 amps in a time of only 50 nanoseconds, our inductor now features a big voltage drop, which means we got a breakdown in the supply voltage of our IC. Combine that with a breadboard construction which comes with noticeable parasitic capacitances and we got ourselves a small oscillator on the supply voltage pin that leads to problems. To solve that, we can add a capacitor in parallel to the supply voltage pin which is then often referred to as a bypass or decoupling capacitor. Its job is to basically provide the high current surge for the IC, which the mains power supply cannot offer because it is too slow, and thus it also suppresses noise for other ICs in the circuit. The only question is what capacitor type is best suited for this job. The two main ratings you usually see on them is their capacitance and their withstand voltage. Now since all of my capacitor voltage ratings are higher than the 12 volts I'm using, we should go for the highest capacitance rating, right? 
I mean, since the capacitance rating is proportional to the stored energy of a capacitor, we should definitely be able to provide enough current with it. So I connected the 15,000 microfarad electrolytic capacitor in parallel to the IC and asserted that the oscillation peaks decrease to 16 and 8 volts. Seems decent. Out of curiosity though, I also tried out a small 150 nanofarads film capacitor as a decoupling capacitor, which worked even better by decreasing the peaks to 13 and 10 volts. But why does such a puny small film cap, whose capacity is 100,000 times smaller than the beefy electrolytic capacitor, works better? Well, the reason is that while all capacitors share the same basic structure, which means they got two metal electrodes, which are separated by a non-conductive material called the dielectric, in order to create an electric field and thus store energy when a voltage is applied, their materials all differ. My electrolytic capacitors, for example, use aluminum foil in combination with an electrolyte, while my film capacitors use polypropylene and my ceramic capacitors use, like the name implies, ceramic. This material choice influences electrical properties, like the voltage or capacitance, but also other properties like for example the expected lifetime or whether a capacitor is flammable. But there are more hidden properties, which we can discover by examining the capacitors with an LCR meter. Sadly though, the 15,000 microfarad one overloaded the meter, but as a replacement I used a 10 microfarad one, which works similarly as a decoupling capacitor. The first thing we notice is that the capacitor not only features a capacitance, but also a resistance and inductance. Those are called equivalent series resistance or ESR and equivalent series inductance or ESL and they do exist in a practical capacitor due to its internal structure. The big problem with that though is that the parasitic resistance creates a power loss. As an example, we can use the 100Hz measurement of the LCR meter to determine a dissipation factor of 0.097. The dissipation factor describes the relation between the ESR and the capacitive and inductive reactants, but let's neglect the inductive one for now. That means the overall impedance of our capacitor acts around 92% like a capacitor and 8% like a resistor, which on the other hand means we waste energy that goes in and out of the capacitor as heat. If we increase the frequency to 1 kHz, we can see how the dissipation factor increases to 0.220 which means the capacitor now features an even bigger resistive component. With rising frequency, this DF value increases, because the dielectric ohmic value increases, while the capacitive reactance decreases with rising frequency. It gets especially interesting when the capacitive reactance equals the inductive reactance of the ESL, which happens at the self-resonant frequency of the capacitor. Above this frequency, the capacitor acts more like an inductor than a capacitor and thus is not interesting for us when it comes to decoupling. Even the datasheet of the electrolytic capacitor gives us a dissipation factor of 16% at 120Hz, which means such electrolytic capacitors are better suited for UFL applications. But if we insert the 150 nanofarad film capacitor into the LCR meter, we can see that its dissipation factor is pretty much zero at 100Hz and 1kHz and only goes up to around 0.001, so 0.1% at 10kHz. The datasheet of the capacitor pretty much confirms those values by giving a DF of only 0.26% at 100kHz, meaning such film capacitors have a very low ESL and ESR rating and thus a high self-resonant frequency, which makes them suitable for LF and MF applications, like our decoupling task. 
But we should not forget about our super tiny ceramic SMD capacitors, for which there apparently exist different classes, like NP0 and X7R. In a nutshell, those two kinds feature a different base material, which has the effect that class 1 ceramic capacitors, like the NP0, are very stable over a wide temperature range, while class 2 ceramic capacitors, like the X7R, are not as stable over a wide temperature range, but feature way higher voltage dependent capacitances. That makes class 1 ceramic capacitors perfect for something like oscillators while class 2 ones could be used for decoupling, right? To find that out, I grabbed the 10 microfarad one and checked it with my LCR meter. At 1 kHz we got a dissipation factor of around 3% and at 10 kHz around 15%. So not as low as the film capacitor, but after soldering it to a THT breakout board and connecting it to my MOSFET driver IC, it reduced the oscillation to better values than what the electrolytic capacitor offered. Now of course, a capacitor datasheet, depending on its type, can give us even more information, like the insulation resistance, which basically sits in parallel to the actual capacitance, or the leakage current, whose name pretty much speaks for itself. But you should now understand that while electrolytic capacitors can be used for buffering energy, which is why you see them often in power supplies, they are generally not well suited for higher frequency filters or decoupling. And if you want more information about other applications of capacitors and the usage of different capacitor types in general, then I highly recommend having a look at the webinar of the Word Electronic ISOS group which you can find in the video description. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Stay creative and I will see you next time.